Well, this year we're going to do something a little bit different. I want us to take a, a brief look at the life of a faithful servant of the Lord, his life, his faith, and his legacy. And so tonight I'm going to be delivering a biographical sermon on the life of St. Nicholas. Now, I'm not going to be referring to him by any other name tonight, certainly not the name he's fa most famous for, but rather I want to deliver to you as accurate of a story as I can based on actual historical sources. Because there's a lot of myths about old St. Nick. Many of them are not true, and some are at best exaggerated. But of the many sources, one key resource comes to us from the 8th century A.D., the first full biography of this beloved man titled The Life of St. Nicholas by Michael the Archimandrite. And while some information is speculative, we do get a clear picture of this man, Nicholas. Now, historically, there have been several St. Nicholases, but our subject tonight is none other than Nicholas of Myra. Nicholas was born in the region of Lycia in the town of Patara around the year A.D. 260. So this is about 200 years after the death of the Apostle Paul. In fact, he grew up in the land that Paul frequented. Patara, the, the city he was born, is sitting in the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea, just down the road from Ephesus. We know that he was born to Christian parents and that he showed spiritual interest at a very young age. However, his childhood was, was no doubt marked with difficulty. Between A.D. 251 and 270, a deadly plague swept through Asia Minor, killing as, many as, uh, as much as 10% of the population, many of them children. And while Nicholas survived, he likely saw many of his family and friends die in this epidemic. In addition to all that, Christianity was outlawed and it was not uncommon for believers to be arrested, persecuted, or even killed for their faith. However, Nicholas grew up hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was a message preached in his church, passed down from generation to generation, originating from the Apostle Paul, who himself, when he visited this city during his missionary journeys in the 50s and 60s. Nonetheless, Christian churches, as a gathering, they were mostly held house to house, not generally in established church buildings. It was in this setting that Nicholas would come to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. At an early age, Nicholas developed godly character, known for his strong morality, humility, and purity. According to Michael the Archimandrite, he never strayed far from the church, and he liked to nest, uh, to nest as a dove, and to the church to him was a refreshment and a comfort. And in his youth, it was said his mind was illuminated by the teachings, and day by day he grew toward a pure and genuine compassion. Of his compassion, Michael records that the story of a man who was so impoverished that he was left no option but to sell his three beautiful daughters into slavery and worse, that his family might have a chance to survive. Well, Nicholas heard about this, and he'd been praying to God that God would use his life for the furtherance of his will. And when he heard about this poor man's plight, he sprung to action. Nicholas's family was considered middle class and was relatively wealthy in comparison to other people. And so Nicholas gave generously but didn't want to disobey the Lord Jesus Christ and give ostentatiously. Matthew 6, 3 says, uh, When you give alms, do not give or do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, but that your giving would be done in secret so that your heavenly Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And so Nicholas, he set out at night and made his way to this man's house and when everybody was sleeping, he filled three small bags of coins, one for each daughter, and threw them in a window into this man's house. And the money was enough for the dowry for each daughter. The next morning when the coins were discovered, the father rejoiced and praised God. And with enough money for a dowry, his daughters could then at once be married and spared from an otherwise immoral fate. And when Nicholas had become aware that the first daughter was set to be married, he set out to the same window of the same house and threw in more money for good measure. When this deed was, was characteristic of, of Nicholas's life, seeking to do all things to the glory of God. 
Now, we don't know when Nicholas entered into ministry, but we know he was relatively young, earning him the nickname, the boy bishop. And in all his ministry, there was an element of mystery to his ministry. According to legend, young Nicholas had fallen asleep and had dreamed of the Lord Jesus informing him to his high calling. He awoke and didn't know what this dream meant or even if it was true. But a few months later, the aged bishop of a neighboring town called Myra died suddenly. In the wake of his passing, the leadership in Myra was looking for uh, someone to take up this mantle, this high calling of being this pastor. The next morning, Nicholas, feeling compelled to go uh, and pray at the cathedral in Myra, he went, and he, as he arrived at the door, the presiding bishop asked who he was. And Nicholas responded, My name is Nicholas, your servant, for Jesus Christ's sake. The bishop was singing praises to God for answering their prayers. And upon hearing the shouts of praise, all the other leaders in the temple, uh, they came and they declared, Nicholas, come forward. And when he stepped forward, the church began uh, to, to pray to God and they declared Nicholas to be the new bishop of Myra to his great surprise and bewilderment. Not only would the Lord qualify the called, but the called are also qualified and Nicholas was such a man. Nicholas flourished in the ministry, but it did not come without a price. As general persecution was on the rise, it all came to a head in the year 303, when Emperor Galerius ordered the destruction of all Christian churches, the banning of all Christian books, the seizure of all Christian property, and the outlawing of any church gathering under the penalty of death. And by December, Diocletian, one of the four Caesars, ordered the torture of any Christian who refused to worship Roman gods. For the next eight years, Christians were savagely persecuted, and Nicholas was one of them. It is said that he bore the scars of that persecution on his body for the rest of his life. However, by 311, the emperor caved to widespread outrage and ordered the toleration of Christianity. But the whole world would be turned upside down when the appointment of the next emperor was made. During all the tumult, several competing Caesars were claiming rule over Rome, but there was a man named Constantine who was dominant and would fight vigorously for the throne. The story goes that as he was approaching a decisive battle, he had some, he'd received, he believed, a vision from the Lord. He believed that God had told him to fly a new banner over his army uh, an X, a letter X, which in the Greek is a chi, with a line through it, which was the symbol of Christ, that he was going to put Christ over as a banner and he would be victorious in battle. And so he ordered every single flag, every single soldier to bear the sign of Christ, and lo and behold, he won. In light of this victory, Constantine bowed the knee to Jesus Christ, and he would later establish what was called the Edict of Milan in 313. So more than just tolerate Christianity, the edict would actually decree benevolent treatment for all Christians. So now they were going to be treated kindly. And within a few short years, Christianity would become the official religion of the Roman Empire. Almost immediately, Constantine got to work in building church buildings, consulting with many pastors, and even printing Bibles. Suddenly, the greatest enemies of the state, Christian pastors, became their greatest asset. And due to nearly three centuries of chaos and persecution, the church was divided and disoriented. Furthermore, considering the fact that good pastors were hard to come by, in fact, the good ones were normally jailed or killed, numerous errors had also crept into the church at large, with a large number of false teachers gaining in popularity. In an effort to unify the church and establish a baseline for sound doctrine, Constantine convened the first worldwide, or what was called ecumenical, council in church history. The emperor invited nearly 1,800 church leaders, uh, but not all of them were able to attend. What we do know is somewhere in the proximity of 300 church leaders arrived in Bithynia to the city of Nicaea, in May 325, and Nicholas was with them. For the next few months, they would meet to discuss pressing issues in Christianity, including the issues pertaining to the observance of holy days, baptism, ordination, church practices, and the restoration of backslidden church members. But far and away, the most important topic that was uh, discussed at this council was the nature of Jesus Christ. 
There were challenges that had arisen about Christ, namely the issue of whether or not Jesus was divine, was God, and eternal. And there was a popular teacher by the name of Arius whose views had been brought into question. Arius, as a man, was a, a learned preacher. He was a charismatic communicator, and he had, had won many people over to his views and his theology. In teaching on the nature of Jesus, he agreed that he was the Son of God, he affirmed that, but he did not hold him to be eternal and unchangeable like God the Father. In essence, he brought Jesus down lower than God the Father. And he believed that when the scriptures taught about Jesus being the begotten Son of the Father, that he was meant that Jesus was a created being. According to Arius, the Son of God had a true birthday. In a letter to a friend, he wrote this, God has an existence prior to that of his Son. Before he was begotten or created or purposed or established, he was not. Therefore, Jesus Christ is not the same God as the Father, he claimed. They were of different substances, similar, but not the same. The Son of God, he claimed, was not himself God. And this teaching sent shockwaves throughout the entire Roman Empire and incited righteous indignation throughout the entire council. Nicholas heard Arius expound his heretical views and would have mourned what he heard because Nicholas loved Jesus Christ. He trusted in him at a, at a young age. He served him faithfully. He obeyed him dutifully and even suffered painfully. Nicholas loved the Lord and he couldn't bear to hear the name of his Savior blasphemed through lies. According to legend, Nicholas broke decorum and he got up out of his seat and he walked up to Arius and slapped him across the face. The whole council was stunned. This humble, mild-mannered bishop from Myra dared to commit an act of violence in, the front, in front of the emperor. And not like the impetuous apostle Peter, who sprang to action in defense of the Lord, cutting off the ear of the Roman soldier, Nicholas acted the same way. John Calvin famously said, a dog barks when his master is attacked. And he says, I would be a coward if I saw God's truth is attacked and yet would remain silent. So the story is that Nicholas, when he did this, Constantine promptly had him seized and placed in jail overnight. But whatever Nicholas did in physical form was no doubt believed by every single bishop in that room. They all knew that what he did was vindicate the truth of who God or who Christ was as God. Arius was wrong and they all knew it. And so our question, the question for the ages is, well, who then is Jesus? Who is he? Who is this baby that was born to Joseph and Mary and placed in a manger? Was he just a, a spiritual hero? Was he a prophet like Isaiah? Was he a miracle worker? Was he simply a good teacher? Who was this man who healed the sick and fed the poor? Who was he who was crucified on a Roman cross? Who was he who was buried in the ground and then seen alive three days later? Who is he who has believed and adored for centuries? Is he just another created being? Is he just like us? Well, the Bible tells us, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it says, the Word, he became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as he, of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. In John chapter 8, the crowds, they asked Jesus who he is and how it is that he can claim that Abraham, who had died 2,000 years earlier, looked forward to seeing his day. And how did Jesus respond? He says, before Abraham was born, I am. He invokes the very name of God and he invokes the very status of being an eternal being. And the crowd wanted to kill him for blasphemy, for claiming to be God. John 10, 30, the crowds were pleading with Jesus to tell him, who are you? He told them and they didn't believe, but he affirmed his relationship with the Father, declaring, I and the Father are one. Speaking of Jesus, the Apostle Paul, who would have stood where Nicholas stood, 
said, He is the image of the invisible God, for in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 19. Even the writer of Hebrews in chapter 1 says, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. What did St. Nicholas believe about Jesus? What did all the leaders at the Council of Nicaea believe about Jesus? Jesus is God in human flesh. That's why we celebrate. Because God has come down to us, lived among us, and given His life as a ransom for many. What a glorious truth to be believed and declared by all who profess to have faith in Jesus Christ. Well, in the end, Arius was condemned as a heretic, and the council drafted a creed to establish the grounds of biblical orthodoxy, and Nicholas would have attached his name to that one. Pertaining to the Son and the Father, the Nicene Creed affirms this, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were both made in heaven and on earth, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was incarnate and made man, he suffered, and on the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Jesus is very God of very God. And he gave his life on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, that all who would repent and turn from our sins and trust in Jesus Christ would be granted the greatest gift of all eternal life, perfect in heaven with the Father. As for Nicholas, he spent his life fighting to defend God's truth against all forms of idolatry. Someday, maybe, I'll tell you the story about how St. Nicholas tore down the temple of Artemis in Myra, but that'll be for a different day. We don't know the exact date, but it's believed that Nicholas died sometime around A.D. 335 at the age of 75 or so. And on his deathbed, he recited Psalm 31. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. And with that, he closed his eyes, and the Lord took him home. So who was the real St. Nicholas? He was a humble, generous Courageous, devoted, loving pastor who loved the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted Him as Savior and as God. And that's the Jesus who we celebrate. We love our Lord very much. The Lord who was born to a virgin, Mary, who lived on earth among men, just like us except He lived without sin. And He died on the cross to pay for our sins and rise again to bring new life to all who would believe and trust in Him. And so that is our, ever our continuous message here, that all who are far off and far away would be brought near and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your goodness. We praise You for our brother Nicholas, for his life of faithfulness. And Lord, I just pray that... Uh, even as there's all kinds of other stories and things spinning around, Lord, that we would take this night and focus directly on You. That all of history, all of biography, all of theology, all of existence points directly back to You. That You are the author and perfecter of faith. That You are the one who reconciles us to Yourself through Your Son. And so, Father, I pray that we would glorify the Son even here and now, as we sing these songs, as we pray, as we think of this wonderful truth that you sent your Son to redeem and save that which has been lost. Lord, I pray that we would not forget this message even today, even tomorrow, and we would glorify your name forevermore. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.